I saw a video this week. It was, it was a weird thing, and I've seen this before, but for whatever reason, this week it just caught my eye. Have you ever seen one of the, a, a video of somebody in, I think it's called a cash booth? Um, and maybe you've, maybe you've done this. I've never, I've never seen this in person, uh, like live in person. Here's what it is. It's like a telephone booth. Uh, maybe just a little bit bigger, and somehow they've hooked this look like an incredible like fan. They've, it's like a wind tunnel, but it's up and down, right? And you're standing in it, and they've put a whole bunch of money in this cash booth, and then they turn it on, and so there's just money flying everywhere inside of here. You've seen these, right? Everybody's seen this, and, and, and then they, uh, they yell go or whatever. I don't know what they do, and, and you get a certain number of seconds, and, and somebody's just trying to like just out of mid midair, just grab as much money as they can. And they're stuffing in their pockets and down their shirt and wherever they can for the 30 seconds. And just, and it just kind of, I don't know if, I don't know if you've ever, if, I don't mean to be like, um, if you've ever done this uh, yourself, please don't be offended by what I'm about to say. <laughs> but I kind of can't help it. It just, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm watching this video and I'm, I'm just kind of like, um, I'm, I, I just become speechless. And if, <laughs> and if you know me, that's weird, right? Um, and, and, I, I, and I'm thinking to myself, I don't think I could ever do that. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I could ever do that. that, that would, I would, it would be... Um, that would be really hard for me, especially if it was in front of people for some reason. So my pride would kick in and, and all this stuff. I'm just like, no, 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 no. Please don't do this. And, and I was thinking, okay, this person was in there for 30 seconds, and they had this, when it was all over, you know, they turned the fan off, and everything settles to the floor, and they've got this big wad of cash, and they open the door, and they come out, and they're like, all right, let's count it all. And, and it was a couple hundred bucks. And... It was definitely not life-changing, all right? You get to take the family out to a really nice dinner or, you know, something, but I was just like, oh, it, was just, it just caused me to cringe a little bit. And then, it, and, and then for whatever reason, I was just like, you know what, that, that it is, in a way, that's what everyone's doing. Maybe not in a booth, but isn't it just kind of, isn't that just sort of the American way, right? That's, that's, that's what we do. It's like we're, we're just out there just grabbing and just trying to gather as much as we can for ourselves. And, and, and whatever, whatever the cost, what, whatever, it just it doesn't matter. And at the end of the day, um, we've, we've filled our pockets with whatever, with whatever we could and stuffed it down our shirts and, you know, put it in our ears, whatever, and we're out of breath and out of time and still broke. A few weeks ago, I talked about how um, since the very beginning, the problem has just been that we're broke. And I'm not talking financially. I'm talking spiritually. I'm talking in every way. We just come into this world and we exist in this world broken, especially apart from Christ. And we're just trying to make it through. And the problem is we are all about I. Just getting getting enough for me, just, just doing all of this. And, and, and over the past few weeks, we've talked about how when we live under the curse, the, the, our, our reality, our everyday reality is that we experience division and, and isolation. We ourselves are divided and isolated. We're not in community as God created us to be when we live under the curse we, we embrace this performance-based, what have you done for me lately kind of, kind of view of the whole world and of our existence, and we hate it, but yet we're so ingrained to it, it just comes so naturally. We just keep, for some reason, we just keep pedaling that same bike, trying to meet my own needs and fill my own hearts, and I never quite get there. 
And maybe sometimes, you know, in those moments, we sort of give ourselves a pep talk and we say, well, but I got to be close. I just need to try again. You know, I just need some heroic effort. That's all it's going to take, right? Sooner or later, we got to get there. And I say, if we ever could have done it, we would have done it by now. And Jesus offers the, us his grace. And, and when we embrace this grace, as we, this is what we talked about last week. When we embrace his grace and when we embrace the, the graceful relationships, we begin to pursue oneness. We realize we're not alone. And, and we, we realize that our value in Christ is not based on our performance. It's based on his love, his grace. He put the price on us. We're filled not by ourselves. You can never be filled by yourself. You can never be filled by others. You can only be filled by Jesus. And I've hope, I hope you, as you've heard this, this has been really encouraging. And, and now what I want to do is in the next few weeks, I want to get really practical about how this looks in real life because that's the whole purpose. I don't know if you remember when we started this whole thing, we were in the book of Ephesians. We just had this, this, uh, this idea, this one simple, incredible idea that, that we ought to be um, imitators of God and love one another. That, that's the this, this central idea and, and what it looks like. That's, this, is, this is what being in a first place family is all about, this key here. And, and, and so what we're going to do today is we're going to actually begin the process of digging into what Paul commands us in in. Ephesians chapter 5. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. Um, we're going uh, to be looking at that. And actually, we're going to take a couple of weeks to do it because this is one of those, this is one of those passages that um, it can be a little bit tough to understand because we're coming, uh, we're coming at it like we kind of come at the whole Bible with just our own, our own perspective, our Western eyes. You know, we're, we're um, you know, our, our, our American categories of thinking. And, and this was written by by a very Eastern thinker. The Apostle Paul was not uh, an American. I, I, I know that comes as a huge shock to, to so many. Um, and so what we need to do is we need to work a little bit. We kind of have to position ourselves right in order to understand some of the things that he's talking because he's going to say some hard things. He's going to start talking about submission and other, you know, perceived dirty words like that. And we got to be careful because we can, we can hear what he's saying, but really hear something else altogether. And it can, it can cause certain things, on, you know, hair on the back of our neck to stand up and say, wait a second, you know, what is all this? And so what we want to do is we want to kind of get into this and understand this well so that we can embrace it. And... Um, and be transformed by it. That's the whole purpose. And so here's where we're going to start. In Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 1, Paul, um, Paul sets the theme for everything he's going to talk about through the rest of this letter of his to the church. Before he gets here, he's talking about the glory of Christ and the beauty of the church and all of these things, just the riches that we have in Christ. And it's, it's, it's mind-blowing, it's breathtaking. And if you've been a Christian for a while and maybe you've studied this and if, if you've heard the gospel, it's huge, right? It's, it's, it's amazing. When we begin to understand the grace that we've been given in Christ, it's no wonder that Paul can spend all this time and, and paper and ink just talking about how how good and how beautiful God is and, and the amazing uh, nature of his love and what he's done for us and, and how beautiful his church is now, this bride of Christ that he has created and bought with his own blood, how majestic it all is and how in love with her he is. Oh, it's amazing. And then he gets to chapter five and he says, okay, now it's your turn. And he says this, therefore be imitators 
of God. Just think about that for a second. Be imitators of God. I'm, uh, I, I, I don't do... I don't do very many imitations. I don't have that kind of skill. Um, I, my, my imitations are pretty weak, actually. I can do an Arnold. and You know what I mean, right? You do the chapa. But everybody can do that, right? That one's, that one's really, really easy. I don't have, uh, I don't have a lot of imitations. And, and uh, some people are really, really clever with it. Right? You, ever, I, you know, there's some great comedians that can do amazing imitations and it just kind of blows us away. Um, but imitate God? Man, I mean, that, that's... Anybody want to take that one on? <laughs> right? Give me your best God imitation. But this is exactly what Paul is saying here. He's saying that we ought to be imitators of God. You see, this is the whole point of following Jesus. Scripture puts it this way. This way. We often, it often calls us to this, this concept of Christ-likeness. To be like Jesus. When we follow in his footsteps, when we love like he loves, when we care about people like he cares, what we're, what we're shooting here for is Christ's likeness. Be imitators of God, Paul says. This is, this is the whole point. And this is actually um, what the call to be a first place family is. A, a group of people who are loving each other the way God loves them that are showing grace to one another, the way Jesus has shown grace to us, of receiving and welcoming and, and and being a family, the way God has made us a part of his family. I mean, he could have just left it at that. Be therefore imitators of God and just do this and watch amazing thing ha- things happen and yet um, I don't know about you but when I even think about this uh, you know the, this this calling to be an imitator of God it just I, I, I think okay um, I have no idea how to do that I am infinitely um, incapable on my own of, of doing this. I've, you know, I've heard the phrase, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but not all the people all the time. But when it comes to this, I'm pretty sure that it's none of the people any of the time, right? This is, that's how it feels, right? Be imitators of God. This is a tall order. Paul, what are you talking about? Be imitators of God? Well, here's the, here's the good news. Um, you actually are not the, the one that's responsible for pulling all of this together and making you able to do this in the first place. Here's, this, is, this is the great news. So, so as we go through this, I think it's going to become abundantly clear. He says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. In other words, he's saying is because something has already happened, you can do this. Don't become imitators of God so that you can maybe become beloved children. That's performance, right? But because of grace, you already are beloved children, even if you're not such a great imitator of God. So be an imitator of God. As beloved children, it says in verse 2, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Let me tell you a secret. That, right there, 
is what imitating God looks like. It obviously can't mean that you need to create the world in, in six days, right? That's not going to happen. You're not going to imitate that. We're, we're not called to imitate God in terms of his power. We're not called to imitate God in terms of his judgment over all things. He is, he is the judge. He is the, the lawgiver, right? We're not called to imitate uh, God by walking on water and performing amazing miracles and feeding millions of people with, with a sack lunch. This is not what he's calling us to do. But here's what he says we can do. We imitate him by walking in love and as he, as he loved us and gave himself up for us. I think, I think I can say it really simply if I just say it like this. When you lay your life down for someone, you're imitating God. Now, I'm not talking about, um, uh, I'm not simply just talking about dying for someone, right? That you can do that once. Um, you can do that once if, if you want to. I'm talking about the kind of laying your life down for someone that happens all the time. You've heard, you've heard the story about uh, the, the married couple. They were always, they were always fighting, and um, they went in, you know, talked to a therapist, and as they were talking together, she's, she, you know, she just says, um, the, you know, the problem is you just don't love me. And he says, honey, you know that I love you. Uh, you, you know that I love you. I would do anything for you. I would die for you. And she looks at him and says, you always say that, but you never do it. <laughs> you can do it once. But you know what's harder than that? I mean, we all have that, you know, there's, there are people in my life that I would lay my life down for, that I would jump in front of a bullet for, or, or you know, d d d give anything. I would give, there are people in my life I would give anything for. That's not what we're talking about. We're, sometimes what, we just, what we're talking about is like the everyday, um, like, is there anyone in your life that you would put the remote control down for? Take your goals and your hopes and your dreams and put them on the back burner for? Is there anyone in your life that you would just kind of Pause your march to victory, your, your life goals, your ambition, and just set those aside for someone else. This is, this is what it means to lay your life down. When was the last time you, you, you lay your life down for your children? When was the last time you laid your life down for your spouse or your neighbor? You know, just take your life and just set it aside and do for someone else. Be imitators of God. Folks, that's what this looks like. Jesus stepped away from the glory and beauty and majesty of heaven, came into this world to live in our dust and our stink and among our sin and give everything for us. And he says, this is, this is what you do. See, see coming to Christ and, and being a part of his family, it it will cost you everything. I, I think we do such a disservice to people when we, when we say, you know, this, the, or, or intimate in any way that following Jesus is somehow easy and, and, and his grace somehow is cheap. It's not. You need to know that following Jesus will cost you everything. Everything. Jesus, Jesus would say stuff like, if you want to follow me, you need to pick up your cross every day and follow me. That's what following Jesus looks like. That, you know, and, and in Jesus' day, I mean, that was, the, that was like the worst form of capital punishment. That is certain death. Your cross is how you die.
I don't know if, how, how that would translate today. Like if Jesus would come and say, you know, you need to go purchase your lethal injection, keep it with you all the time, and follow me. Your electric chair, your noose, your whatever. I mean, this is, you, you, you basically saying, you, you're laying your life aside. It, it costs us everything to follow Jesus. There is no, there is no cheap grace. There is no easy, you know, easy three steps of salvation It's not a fire insurance policy. It's a relationship with an almighty God who came and gave us everything and he says, lay down your life and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Jesus was really good at um, dispersing crowds that way. I don't know if you notice, like when you're reading through the Gospels, there, he'll be preaching these sermons and people are just coming out of the woodwork, right? To go out into the desert, they'll be in the middle of nowhere, just to hear Jesus and, and, and just be a witness to the things that he's going to do, right? And everybody's just excited. What's Jesus going to do today? Nobody ever knows. It's going to blow us away. It always does, every single time. And he'd have these huge crowds, and, and he'd be speaking to all these huge crowds. And I think, um, you know, I, don't know if, I don't know if this thought actually crossed his mind or, or how this worked, but I think sometimes Jesus would just say, too many people. Time to thin the herd. And so he'd start talking like that. And I'm, I can just imagine his disciples going, Jesus, you know, this, this, all this Drinking blood and eating flesh stuff and carrying your cross stuff and all that, it really, I mean, it's great and everything. You're Jesus. It's great. But um, maybe let's call time out on some of that stuff, right? These people, maybe let them, um, let them invest a little bit more before you run them off or, you know, something like that, right? Let's make friendships first and then give them the bad news, Right? Stop running everybody off, Jesus. And he does this all the time. And, and here, here's the reality. There's, there's, uh, it's, it's no good news to you for you to hear that it's all, you know, that it's all roses and daisies. And Jesus is calling us to say, listen, if you want this, if you want to be a part of what I'm doing, you're going to have to learn to love like me. You're going to have to learn to imitate my love. And my love is a lay your life kind of down love. Lay your life down kind of love, rather. That's what it looks like to be an imitator of God. To truly love one another. Now, in chapter, in chapter 5 here, this is where it gets confusing because Jesus talks about this being an, or excuse me, Paul, the Apostle Paul talks about being an imitator of God, and then, and then he, he begins this list, and he says, in verse 3, he says, but sexual immorality and all impurity and covetousness, covetousness must not even be named among you as it is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking which are out of place, but instead there should be thanksgiving, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetousness, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God. And he goes on about all this stuff, and, and, and we can look at that, we can say, wait a second, wait a second, isn't that all performance-based stuff? Didn't we, just, didn't we just come to the conclusion that this was all about grace and not performance? And the answer is yes, we did. You are not saved by doing lots of good and, you know, behaving. You can't behave your way into heaven. But there is, there is a kind of love of imitating God, of laying your life down that is legit, that is honest, that is real, that is actual, it's from your heart, it's, it's honest. And there is a type that is definitely not. It is easy for us to follow Jesus in words. It's easy to say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. Everybody... <laughs> Everybody wears a cross. It's, it's amazing to me when you, when, when you run into people who clearly um, have, um, and I, this might feel a little, uh, a little judgy, but um, you know, every now and then on, we see people on TV or, or you know, famous people who um, you can just see, and their lifestyle is, has nothing to do with following Jesus. But they wear his cross around his neck. 
around their neck. They have outward signs of, of certain things. You know, they've adopted this. Maybe they might even be wearing a, um, do people still do this, wear what would Jesus do bracelets or, you know, not, yeah. Uh, have the right kind of Bible cover, bumper sticker, or a T-shirt. There is, there is a reality that comes into play here when our hearts are truly devoted to Christ, to following Jesus. He wants a real relationship. He's not looking for some, you know, to, to give out some kind of cheap grace uh, to all of us that, that really means nothing. Congratulations, you got your fire insurance policy all buttoned up. You can put it in the drawer, live the rest of your life, no worries. It's not what Jesus invited us to. He invited us to a lifelong pursuit of his love. And we're not brought into that pursuit by our performance. And friends, I'm even here to tell you that we're not kept in that pursuit by our performance. But the question is, where is our Where is our heart actually in all of this? Because here's what we do. We make this whole thing about us. We make this whole thing about us getting our own hearts filled, about us getting our own way, about us, you know, getting that feeling. I want that feeling, um, you know, that I'm always looking for. And, and Paul in this, cha- in this chapter says, yes, everything that Jesus called us to is so beautiful, but here's, here's your part of this. We strive to be imitators of God, and the way we lived before Jesus is not an imitation of God. That is, a, that is us trying to fill our own cup, all of these things. He goes on in verse 6, he says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not become partners with him, for at one time you were darkness. That time he's talking about is before Christ, before Jesus was in your life. You were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. There's been a change. There's a difference. You're a part of a new family. So he says, walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Again, we don't do that because we don't do that because uh, we're we're hoping somehow to, to. act our way into his grace. Rather, we do that out of the joy of knowing that we are saved and loved by Jesus. That he lives inside of us and has now made a way, the power of his Holy Spirit, a work in our life, has made a way for us actually to become imitators of God. To be able to let our light shine, to take, uh, to take all of this love that he has given us and, and share it with others as we lay our life down. For the family that Jesus has made us a part of. So it's in the light of all this. I, 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 I say this, is, this can be confusing because it almost feels like uh, it almost feels like he's changing topics really fast. You know, he's, he's talking, but he's not. This is all the same topic as, as Paul writes in this, in this passage. And so he's talking about all of these things. They're all things that we can do, all different ways in which um, we need to re, kind of relook at our life and, and the way we love other people. And begin to kind of compare it to how Jesus loved people and learned to be ourselves better imitators of his love. Not searching out our own good, not trying to fill ourselves up, but rather allowing him to fill us up. This is why he commands us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is where it all comes from. And then he does, uh, in in verse 22, he sort of shifts gears a little bit, and he begins, he's talking about the whole church. In verse 3, all this other stuff, he's talking to the whole church, talking to everybody. And now what he's going to do is he's going to begin to just feature different relationships that are inside the bodies. And so he starts with the the marriage relationship, husbands and wives, right? And he he begins with husbands, or excuse me, he begins with wives, and he says, wives, submit to your husbands. 
And, and then he goes to husbands and he says, husbands, love your wives. And we're going to, in case you're, I, if you're waiting for me to get into this, that's going to happen next Sunday. So come back next Sunday. We're going to get into this really good. We're going to be talking about submission and, um, and it's going to be great. You're going to love it. But, um, but, but, but right now, we're not... But right now, we're just, he's, he's talking about all these things. And he's, I want you to know, he's talking about the same thing to all these different groups of people. He says, children, obey your parents, for this is right. And, and he talks to parents, and he says, parents, don't exasperate your children. You love your children. Lay your life down for your children, right? It just, it, in different relationships, that being an imitator of God applies a little bit differently. It looks different in different relationships. How we do that. When he says, husbands, love your wives, and, and, and then in verse 31, he says this. He says, maybe what is the most important part of this entire passage and so let's take a careful look at this. He says in verse 31, he says, uh, he's, quoting, he's quoting back in Genesis. This is before chapter three. This is chapter two when there is no curse yet. God had just created man and woman and he brought them together and he, and he made this thing that was, that was beautiful. It was, a, it was a representation of him. He, he took his image and he invested it in mankind so that mankind could be an imitator of almighty God. And Paul quotes that passage. He says, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. And then Paul says this, verse 32. This mystery is profound. I kind of, I kind of think, you know, so every now and then uh, we get together, you know, guys will get together and somebody will say, I just don't understand women. And all the other guys laugh. Right now, you're afraid to laugh. I get it. You're, you're sitting by your wife. It's okay. You don't have to laugh. Oh, well, you did. And, and people will say things like, oh, don't try to figure it out. And, and I, hear, I hear you women talking like that too, okay? So men, men this, is, this isn't a, just a guy thing, right? Uh, we, we, are, we have a hard time understanding one another. What is wrong? What is wrong with? And then we just like fill in the blank, right? If, whatever you're not. When, when Paul says this here in, in, in this passage, this mystery is profound. All of those things just come. Paul is just like, I don't understand this at all. Listen, if you're looking for insight and clarity on why in the world God, you know, did this and made us the way he made us, and it can be so confusing sometimes, and all that Paul's saying, that's, that's, I'm not here to explain the intricacies of you know, human marriage and that relationship and, you know, why it's supposed to be, you know, so genius. It's a profound mystery, Paul says. But look what he says. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. In other words, this whole, this whole relationship of Christ and the church, you know, we, we talk about how the, the church is the bride of Christ, right? And that, that Jesus, that Jesus has, has, um, has betrothed to himself. And, and one day, right, we talk about this, and when, when we go to heaven, one day there's going to be this marriage feast of the Lamb when the church the bride of Christ, and when the bridegroom, Jesus himself, are going to be united forever. There's this marriage feast, right? We, we talk about all of these things, and listen, he, this, this word picture, this, this, it's not a metaphor. This, this idea, this concept, and Jesus didn't give us this. The Holy Spirit didn't teach us about the the bride of Christ and Jesus, so that we could take notes and figure out how to be married right. It's actually the opposite. According to the will of God, if you're married, according to the will of God, your marriage is about Jesus. 
not you. If you're a parent, your relationship with your children is about Jesus, not you. Your relationship with a body of believers, a church, this this church here and the relationship that you have with it, isn't actually about you. It's about Jesus. All of these things, it's all about him. We, we learn to do all this because it's about him. Our pursuit of Jesus is not about us in the end. It is, about, it is all about Jesus. All of this refers to Christ and the church. The reason that you as an individual are created in the image of God is not you. You're not the, the absolute reason why. And let me tell you, that's way better it's way better. One, one preacher put it this way, you are a means and not an end. It's why, it's, it's why you have a purpose. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but if, if, if it was really all about you, you wouldn't have a purpose. Everything else would have a purpose, and the purpose would be you. But you are not the end. You are a means to the end. And you've been created with a purpose. And the ultimate reason in your life is Jesus. It's the reason you were created in his image. And if you're married, it's the reason you're married in Christ. And if you have children, it's the reason you have children. And if you have friendships, It's the reason for your friendships. It's the why. Why have friendships? It's actually not for you. It's all about Jesus. All these things are all about him. And so, folks, for us, the the big so what, the what do we do now is, is simply this. We need to begin to see every aspect of our lives as a potential act of worship. I want you to see this again. It says, Be imitators of God. If we go back up to verses one and two, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. And then it says at the end there, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. That's another way of saying worship. He's not saying this is a way for you to sing a song to, to somebody or to, that's, that's not the point. But when we, out of our reverence and love for Jesus, imitate Jesus and by loving others as, as he loved us and laying down our lives for others as, they, or as he laid down his life for us, that is worship. It is worship, and every we need to begin to see every aspect of our life and every relationship in our life as a potential act of worship. When we begin to see this, when we begin to open up our eyes to that reality, things begin to change in a huge way. People begin to grow spiritually in a huge way when when they begin to open up their hearts to this reality. That every opportunity is an opportunity to demonstrate walking in love as Christ did. An opportunity to imitate God. An opportunity to give yourself up for someone else as Christ gave himself up for you. When you begin to see each of the moments in your life as a potential act of worship, as opposed to a potential act of earning God's love, what a huge waste of time. And a complete misunderstanding of who God is, right? I mean, what a waste of time. Why would we do that? We don't have to do that. It's done. Or worse yet, earning someone else's love. When we do that, we remove, when we we begin to see it in light of of eternity, in light of God's um, vision for our Uh, lives, what happens is we remove both self and others as the candidate for center of my life status. Let 
You begin the, the practical process of, of installing Jesus as Lord in his rightful place of honor and power in your life and relationships. Saying Jesus is Lord doesn't make Jesus Lord. Making Jesus the center is what it's all about. It's these, all of these things are all about him. And when we do this, we open the door for his power and his grace and his wisdom and his righteousness to begin to transform your own heart and then your relationships and then your family and your work and your world. If doing this sounds risky... If, you know, all the stuff that I've been talking about last few weeks, if it sounds risky, I get it. And I can, almost, I can almost hear like a little bit of pushback from the table and be like, okay, listen, John, if, if, if I start making Jesus the focus, if everything is a potential act of worship, if I am not, the, in other words, if I'm not the focal point of my life, if I'm not taking control and making sure that I'm getting mine, then who will? And what I think maybe sometimes we mean is nobody will. How am I supposed to survive if no one's watching out for me? Who's going to take care of my needs and my interests? And here, I, I, this is what Jesus said. This is a promise that he made, okay? This isn't, this isn't my promise. This is his promise. He says this. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, we have it recorded. Jesus says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. Here's what I'm telling you. That we work so hard just trying to grab everything out of the air, stick it in our pockets, just trying to fill up our own hearts, our own self, our own worth. And we work so hard on doing that. All of these things that we're grabbing for become the center point of our life. It becomes our focus. It becomes our God. And we might be grabbing for, um, you know, for physical things like wealth and, you know, lots of cool stuff and better clothes and, and all that. Or we might be, gr you know, grabbing for other people, people who can come in and somehow, somehow help me be enough, be worth it. Jesus says, that's me. That's where I belong in your life. And you don't have to grab for anything. You don't have to work hard for anything. I've already done it. I've already made you everything. You're already enough. Just come and seek him. Seek his kingdom. He has the ability to fill you up. This is a great thing about belonging to Jesus. It's no longer my role anymore. I can retire. It's not my role to fill me up anymore. It's no longer anyone else's role to fill me up anymore. It's Jesus' role now. He's the one who fills me up. He's the one who meets my deepest needs. He's the one who validates my life and fills it with significance. He's the one who fills my life with good. He's the one that makes my days matter. He's the one who raises me up. He's the one who produces joy and peace and hope and love in me. Not me. Not you. It's not about us. It's never been about us. It'll never be about us. It's all about Jesus. Your job is not to fill up your cup. That's Jesus' job. Your job is to empty your cup so he can fill it up. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your, uh, your love for us that is beyond comparison. And oftentimes, Father, it's, it's, it's so beyond our own ability as human beings to even wrap our mind around what you have done for me, what you have done for us. God, your grace is, uh, it's hard. It's hard for us to grasp it because we don't produce it. It's not, it, we're, we're just, it takes us a while to feel at home in it. Father, I pray that you would somehow, through the power of your Holy Spirit, through, um, through the power of, for transformation of your word. That God, that you would teach us to be at home in your grace. God, that you would teach us to, to lay our lives down for one another in the love that you have given us to love one another. God, that you would somehow speak to us in such a way that we would learn to be operators inside of your kingdom rather than ours. And that we would experience the joy and the peace and the hope and the majesty and the power of being a part of your family and not settle for anything less. God, thank you for filling us up, for, for being our filler. Help us to empty our cup so that you can. It's my prayer. In Jesus' name.